Hello, children. It's your boy here in the lab. Basically for today, I just wanted to take the opportunity to show you how a lot of this lab equipment works that you'll need to use for the AP test. I've got it all set up here, so I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly and show you how it could be used for some experiments. The first device we're gonna talk about today is a motion sensor. This is a motion sensor. It has this little array of you know fine little pieces of metal that basically function as a diaphragm. They vibrate back and forth, sort of how a microphone works. And so essentially what it does is it sends out sound waves. The sound waves bounce off of the object you're trying to measure the velocity of and then it sends it back to the detector. Basically by using the Doppler effect, which we learned about in the honors class, it's able to figure out the speed and the location uh, of the objects. Now you might be looking at that thing and you might be thinking, well, wait a second, isn't that hard for this device to track? Because it doesn't have a very large front here. That's true. They sell these nifty little targets with a magnetic attachment on the back so you can affix it to your little lab card here. And now you've got a nice big target for the sound waves to bounce off of. Now, I just wanna show you this very quickly. First of all, there's our little computer program. It's called Logger Light. It works perfectly well with these sensors. It's pretty cool, actually. You take it, you plug it in with the USB, bang. It opens the graph right away on the computer. And of course, we'll do this in a couple minutes, but you can switch it, as you can see here, from position to velocity to acceleration. It's pretty cool. I'm gonna leave it on position for a second. So notice, I just wanna hit the collect button here. Sorry that I just jumped around so much, just so you can actually hear the noise that this thing makes while it's in operation. Here we go. I'm not sure if you could hear that. I have it set right now to collect for five seconds. That's a setting that you can change. We don't really need to for the purposes of this demonstration. So this thing flips up if you want it to, and now it can be pointed at that object. And notice here it has two settings because it can measure uh, the velocity of the cart, like something that it's specifically designed for. Notice this is a vernier motion sensor, dusty, and a vernier lab cart. Uh, and so they're really set to work together. Uh, and so let's just see how it goes. I'm gonna give this a little push here in the beginning. Uh, just so we can get going and then we'll hit collect and see what it looks like so these are low friction carts on a low friction track so what we should expect to see is a nice smooth constant velocity ah okay and notice there's our graph here right in the beginning we had a nice smooth straight line because it was moving at a constant velocity but look what happened to it at the end slowed down a little bit friction eventually overcame the thing and slowed it down that is to be expected to some degree because they say they're low friction carts, but of course they're not no friction carts. Now I wanna just give it a faster push because basically if we allow friction to act over a smaller amount of time, the impulse, right, uh, you know, delivered by the friction is gonna end up being smaller. And so it's not gonna make the cart slow down as much. And of course we could see that from the graph. And so I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna hit collect first cause I'm gonna push it pretty dang hard and I only have five seconds. Here we go. Notice, a little bit of a harder bang at the end, but we had a nice, smooth, constant velocity throughout. Now, this is the best part of this software. You can just grab any section of it and then say, I'd like to know what the velocity is, please. And you can hit analyze and then linear fit and bang, it gives you the linear fit. Notice, it says the slope here was 1.351 meters per second. Pretty cool. We have a one-to-one -one correlation there also, as you can see. Uh, and so that tells us that this is a damn straight line because we sent this thing going so fast that it worked perfectly. Notice here it eventually stopped at the end, and so the line of best fit doesn't work for that. But I just want to show you, we can also just get the graph to do the work for us, although it's a little difficult for the computer to do that work, because um, it's basically just using like some calculus to be able to spit out a velocity versus time graph. And so these are always a little messy. In my opinion, it's just a lot better to use the position versus time graph and find the slopes. Now, of course, if you want the object to accelerate, then the position versus time graph isn't so great. Uh, but we can just show that very quickly here. I'm gonna reset the graph, and I'm basically just gonna hit collect and I'm gonna lift the end of this track up. So notice, there it goes. And we can see here that that's shown as a nice smooth increase on our velocity versus time graph. Now, by the time the thing fully reached the constant acceleration, it didn't have much time to go, but we can just get a rough idea of what that acceleration was. Notice by grabbing that section, hitting analyze, and then hitting linear fit, and cool. And notice it even does all the work for us. Look at the slope now, because this is a velocity versus time graph, it tells us that the slope is 0.8 meters per second per second, or in other words, meters per second squared. These things are awesome, and I hope you realize how awesome they are. Probably, in my opinion, the best thing about them is they can be used in a lot of different ways. Let's say you wanna do an experiment where you have a really light cart 
crashing in to some big heavy monster of a car, like this one. And notice here, I've got the Velcro tips on that end, but I have no Velcro on this end. I can flip this around though, because I do believe these have magnets in them. Cool. So now we can use the magnets in here to show a perfectly inelastic collision. Sweet. And I'm just gonna disattach these cards, unattach, whatever. Um, and so you should all have a pretty good sense of what's gonna happen. I'm just gonna switch this back to a position versus time graph so you can really see the goods here. And I'm gonna hit collect, and then I'm gonna push this card into that card, and we can see what happens. Collect. And so notice here, we had a nice velocity, definitely straight enough in there to give us a good slope. So we had our initial velocity for that single card of 0 0.6053. And then eventually after they crashed, you can see the collision time there perfectly because the uh, the slope changes. And then notice we can just drag this thing over real quick. You know, So if you were actually doing an experiment, you'd write that number down real quick. Then you'd just drag this guy over here and then you'd look at that velocity and it's 0 0.1713. That's a pretty dramatic reduction in the velocity, but that makes sense because these carts are roughly the same mass. <sighs> these carts are roughly the same mass, but these masses combined are pretty heavy. I forget what the numbers are now because I haven't done labs with kids in my class for a long time and I don't have a digital scale out right here. But I think overall the thing ends up being like 200 grams when it's empty and like 800 grams when it's full. So effectively what we saw in the beginning is uh, a 200 gram cart moving on its own and then it ended up crashing into a cart that had a mass that was four times larger so the overall mass ended up being five times larger and so of course the velocity should be cut by about a factor of five and isn't that what happened i don't remember what the numbers are now anymore but you can go ahead and fact check me and just go back in the video and look at what that initial velocity measurement was wasn't it 0.6 i thought it was and that's pretty cool that even just by that like quick rule of thumb kind of physics we can see like oh wow yeah holy crap conservation of momentum really does work it was 0.6, wasn't it? Oh no, of course this thing is going to give me trouble now that I'm trying to show you. I'm going to use my actual mouse here. And so notice I'm just going to drag this thing over. And it was about 0.6, so you notice more or less the velocity went from 0.6 something to about 0.1 something, and so it did more or less go down by a factor of 5. Physics works. That's pretty cool. Now, what you should also realize is that the motion sensor doesn't just work for carts. It also works for people basketball obviously but other things like an oscillating spring system notice i can take these keys and i can set them into oscillation directly above the motion sensor and the motion sensor will capture position versus time data so we'll let it go and notice it's got a nice smooth oscillation and it looks like i'm just going to move that a little bit this way and i'm going to hit collect notice it's sinusoidal it's oscillating it's sinusoidal that's so cool. If you don't think that's cool, honestly, then I just feel sorry for you. Notice here that we have like a nice graph and I can hit analyze and I can do all sorts of things. I can zoom the graph in, I can zoom the graph out if I want. And it's important to realize here that you can do all sorts of things with these motion sensors. Notice I can turn to a velocity versus time graph. This appears here to start at a negative uh, when I started the sensor. And then here, notice uh, we got a nice sinusoidal velocity graph. What about an acceleration graph? <gasps> we got a nice acceleration graph. Notice though it's not as smooth. Like I said, it's really just kind of running calculus and not measuring the acceleration directly, but really trying to use, you know, the slope of the tangent line from the position versus time graph and then the slopes of the tangent lines from the velocity versus time graph that it produced from the slope of the tangent line from the position graph, so it gets a little messy. But what you should realize is that you can select any of these points using this examine tool and figure out exactly where that peak is. And of course you can figure out exactly where the peak is because you can see, notice the velocity is 0.472, it's bigger there, and then it gets smaller again, and so we know that that's going to be our peak, more or less, uh, at 0.4 seconds, and then we can come over here and do the same thing at about 1.5 seconds. Notice this thing slowed down, but that makes sense because it's losing energy. It's a damped oscillator, um, and so, you know, we can use that information to figure out our period of the oscillation. Now, honestly, because the velocity versus time graph, like I said, is manufactured from this graph, I'd probably just scale this thing and then use the position versus time graph to find the period. When you scale it, notice it zooms in on it, so it like gives you some better readings. It's a little easier to read the whole thing. And that's pretty cool. So it's important to realize when you are gonna talk on the AP test about the motion sensor, you wanna talk about how this thing is capable of collecting position and velocity data, but that it can also be used to determine things like acceleration. Now the last thing I wanna do with this, just because I think it's pretty cool, and I, we'll see if we can get it to work, 
is if you may remember, there was a free response question where we had a cart moving up a ramp and then down a ramp. And the whole purpose of that question was to show that the acceleration is actually different on the way up and on the way down. And so what I want to do here is I just want to take one of these boxes, put it under the end. So now we have a nice ramp. I hope you can see here that this is uneven. Maybe we'll do a little bit of this action. It's a ramp. And I'm going to take the cart and I'm going to push it up and I'm going to push it down. And we'll see if we can get a nice acceleration versus time graph to show that the acceleration is in fact different on the way up and the way down. So here we go. I'm going to collect. Now I'm going to stop it. Hit. Notice for our position versus time graph, a nice cool parabolic function here. And I am going to hit velocity. And notice here now, you can see once this thing begins to slow down and speed up, that you'll be able to see some differences in the accelerations. So notice this beginning was when it was slowing down, uh, and so this was on the way up. I am going to analyze and do a linear fit, and that gives me an acceleration of negative 0.4826. And then I'm going to do the same thing. Wait, where does that start and where does that end? Oh, there. And I'm going to do the same thing on the way down. And notice here, I see a slightly lower acceleration. Instead of negative 0.4 something, it's negative 0.39. Now remember why that was the case. When this thing was going up, it had the force of friction acting backwards. Yeah, it's a low friction cart, but clearly you can see that there's some friction acting on this thing along with gravity. It's got the force of friction acting backwards and FGX, but on the way down, it has FGX acting down, but the force of friction acting up the ramp. And so the net force on the way up is the sum of the friction force and FGX, and on the way down, it's the difference between the friction force and FGX. And honestly, this is the reason why I feel bad about you guys missing out on all the great lab experiences this year because it is truly awesome to be able to use a pen and paper and your brain and figure out that, well, if we have a car going up the ramp and down the ramp, well, the forces are acting in different directions. That should mean the accelerations should be in a different direction and then be able to do an experiment where we actually confirm that they're different. And notice I'm just gonna pull this back up one more time, hit linear fit, see if it'll give me the second one. Notice here, clearly, there's a difference and the accelerations. And that's pretty cool. The theoretical and the experimental come together. Now, as you can also see here, and I'm probably gonna do a cut in a second, oh, I have photo gates to show you. Now, unfortunately, the thing about the photo gates is they have to be plugged into this janky like device that's probably older than, oh God, you guys are all probably born in like 2005, right? Or 2004 or something? Oh my God, you guys are so young. Uh, yeah, this is older than you, like for sure. Um, these old handheld devices are kind of whack but I think they work pretty well with the photo gates. Now, of course, if you were in lab, you would know after you plug in the photo gates, you wanna make sure you do this because if it's tracking your finger, then the light is gonna light up. And is it doing that for both? Oh yeah. So if you can see in here, there's a hole right there and there's a beam coming out of one of these holes and there's an opening on the other side where the beam is coming in. And basically, whenever you break the beam, the photo gate goes, oh, there's something in between it. Start measuring the time. And so notice here, the photo gate can show you a lot of stuff. You see here how it says photo gate timing? Hi. Uh, you see here how it says photo gate timing? So the flag length is the length of the thing that's passing through the photo gate. That's going to be this thing for these carts. So I measured it using that vernier caliper, and I got, uh, what did I get? 9.3 millimeters. The photo gate spacing is zero, and the time and gate, I don't want to really see. It doesn't matter how long it's in there. What I want to see is the velocity in the photo gate. Now you could also set them up to tell you the time that they spend in between the photo gates and the velocity between the photo gates, but we really don't care about that. And so for this device, when you set this thing up and you just hit play, uh, it'll tell you, or do you have to go, I haven't, sorry, it's been a while since I've used this. If you go here and go to digits, then it'll tell you the velocity in the photo gate. And so notice I just took my hand and went like that and then it's showing me the velocity of my hand. Now I just did it faster, and I'm gonna to try to do it faster, and so you can see that it's making some measurements. Now, of course, my hand is not the right length, and so it's not measuring the velocity of my hand accurately at this point, because notice I'm putting my hand in like that, and this computer is programmed for something of that size to only pass through it, but I can take this and put it down here, and then slide my cart through it, and we'll be ready to go. So you gotta take these and like tuck them behind there. These wires are annoying. This is not designed for this track. Like you send it through, and it tells us the velocity of the thing is 0 0.79. Now, of course, there can be an argument about which one is more accurate. And we can see that here today. 
Now the problem is, you're gonna notice this. The motion sensor gets a little screwed up once the cart goes near the photo gate because it starts to pick up the signal from the photo gate and then we got problems. But we'll just do a quick little trial run here. I'm gonna take the thing, push it, and get the two velocity measurements. Ah, already crashed. Um, so notice here, you can see my velocity is 0.8. And from the program here, you can see my velocity is 0 0.7803. Whoa. They basically agree. Now, obviously, there's some experimental error. The clear experimental error is in using this thing to measure the size of that pole, particularly because these poles are industrially produced, so they're not uniform. But that's pretty sweet. I hope you would all agree. Now, what is particularly nice about these things is that you can somehow, I forget, use this to get the velocity in the second gate. It's somewhere here. Hang on. Ah, yes, I forgot this part. These things are so old that I don't know if you guys remember before, but over there it said one and then one, two. You have to like plug them both in and then unplug them from this adapter to be able to get them to show up separately. So this should work here. I have 9.3 times 10 to the negative three. But if you can tell when I move over, now it's got my wrong number in here. So you put the length of the pole in there. 9.3 times 10 to the negative three. You hit your little check mark. This number is zero. And then time and gate, don't care. Velocity in gate two, yep. No and no, cool. So same thing over here. No, I don't want the time in the gate either. Or the time between gates. Now the reason why I set all those things to not visible is because it just makes this menu easier to sort through. Notice now it's not showing me time and gate anymore. It's just showing me the velocity in gate two. So if I hit play, bing, 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 there's my first velocity. And there's my second velocity, cool. And I have it set up in the right order too. That's really just dumb luck. I often screw that up. And then I have to remember the bottom one is the closer gate or whatever. Uh, so notice here, you can basically use the photo gates exactly like you use the motion sensors. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take my heavy cart and I'm gonna put it in between the gates. And I'm gonna take my light cart and I'm gonna put it before the gates. So if I take the first cart and I throw it through the gate, this gate is gonna measure the velocity of that cart. And then this gate is gonna measure the velocity of both of them stuck together. Well, that's a problem. This is the kind of nonsense you have to deal with in the lab. You gotta be a little creative about this crap sometimes. Ooh, is it touching? Oh my god. All right, close enough is good enough. It's just missing. Um, now, notice that exact issue of having to position this thing wrapped around the thing to get it to be able to clear it by one millimeter is exactly why when all of you strike it rich, you should remember, come back to your old pal Mr. Huber, and donate some money from his physics lab. I'll name the lab after you. We'll call it the whoever donates the money memorial lab. Look at it. Oh, it's just in such disrepair, and it can use your dollars greatly. Okay, so let's just do this here quickly. Uh, let's just go. Here. One, two, three. Super slow. Okay, it ended up hitting the gate at the end, but notice here, we see this approximately factor of five decrease in the velocity. Now it's a little worse, and clearly you can see the thing clipped the photo gate. Can I raise it? Oh, I can raise it. That's my fault. It's not as high as it could be. So we'll do this one more time. Sorry. One, two, three. Oh, now one of the cards sounds like they're off. Oh, you can hear it probably speaking maybe in the video. Oh, something's messed up. Okay, here we go. Now, some of you might be thinking, doesn't this dude use iMovie? How did he not edit this out? And there's a reason I'm not editing this out. Because this kind of lab magic by trial and error is a really important thing for science, I think. And I really do wish you didn't miss out on it this year. Because some of this like frustrating stuff is where the magic is. All right, here we go. One, two, three. What? Oh, I see. It's hitting so hard, but this thing keeps coming off. Can you see the separation? Okay. Let's maybe just do it this way for the purposes of not making you want to die while you're watching this. Oh, we don't even need that anymore. We're not using the motion sensor. That's silly. It was hitting this cart so hard that it was falling off. We didn't need it. Silly. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. There we go and we see an approximately factor of five decrease in the velocity. Success. Now, what's particularly dope about the, the photo gates is that
that you can set up the magnets on these things. Like, see, of course, you can see that I put the foam down. You see how these stick together? You can flip the magnets around and make a perfectly elastic collision because then they'll repel each other. So notice the photo gates are great for that because if you'll notice here, we can send the card in and the magnets will make these things repel each other. Now, of course, you'll notice if you were in the lab, the mass difference can't be too great or the one card is just gonna get thrown off the track. But if we put that card here and this card here, we can go long. And of course, it's not wanting to cooperate with me, probably because I don't have it evenly balanced. We'll try this one more time. What I ended up finding in my experiments is you kind of have to do this slow to make it work. But if we try it, notice here we got a nice elastic collision and some destruction there at the end. And we see that when they're about equal mass, they end up having similar velocities at the end. Pretty cool. So that's it for the photo gates. Photo gates, remember, can be used to measure the time in between the gates, but the velocity is the real perfect photo gate measurement. Now, of course, the time could be useful because if I put, if I go back here and the flag length, like let's say I put it as a meter, if I dropped a meter stick through it, it would measure the time it take, the time it took for a meter stick to fall. And if it measured the time it took for a meter stick to fall, then that would be like a little interesting way. That brings us lastly to our force sensors. Now, the first thing to know about the force sensors is you've got two kinds of attachments for your force sensors. You got these kinds, your nubblies, these are your push sensors, and you got your pull boys, these are for pulling. Now, of course, this one is pushing left. Oh, so I guess we'll see if I screwed this up. This one's pushing left, so is this force negative? Oh yeah. And this one is right, and so now it's pushing negative also. And so what you wanna do here is make that gold one positive. And so we can come here, and there's a way to do this. We come down here, and is that force one? Yes, it is, and we're gonna hit reverse. And then when we collect it again, this one's going right, so it's positive. This one's going left, so it's negative. Cool. Now, what we're gonna wanna do before we make any measurements with a force sensor, zero them out. Oh, I gotta stop collecting. We're gonna wanna zero them out. No, stop. Okay, we're gonna wanna zero them out. And then we can demonstrate the third law, right? So I'm just gonna push these together. They're exerting forces. They're exerting forces on each other. Forces. Force, force, force. Force. Now we'll smash this one into this one. Boom. And as you can see here, the forces are always equal and opposite. Now the smash didn't get collected because it ran out after five seconds, but we can smash again. Smash. And we can see, notice, the forces are equal and opposite. Now can I, can I do a zoom? Now notice here, what's cool about this program, this is using a different program, it's called Graphical Analysis. You can highlight all of this, and then it says View Integral, and Integral is the calculus name for area under the curve. And notice here, the areas under the curve, keep in mind, this is a force versus time graph, so that's gonna be the impulse. Notice the impulses are basically equal and opposite with an experimental error. Now of course there is some experimental error because the force sensors are not both reading zero, but if they were, then we'd be right on. Notice here, where is it? The area under the curve is off by about 16. Well, of course, the best thing about the pulling feature of these four sensors is that you can use them to do experiments for the coefficient of friction. Now, what probably should be noted, like for sure, is that this is not the way you would wanna do this. You would want to tie a string, because notice here, this is not totally in line, and if I wanna make this totally flat, then it lifts up the block. It kinda screws this up. If we attach the string, we would avoid this problem. Having said that, I wanna just kinda of quickly show you how this works, and so we're not gonna to go too, too nuts about this. My force sensor zeroed out, so if you remember for the drag test, we basically gotta just ever so slightly pull more and more and more until the thing starts to move, and then try to pull it at a constant speed. What we should see is an increase in the graph up to some peak value, and then a constant value. And notice that's what we see. Now it started negative, because I zeroed out the wrong force. But if I zero out the right force now, and I think we shall be in business. We'll do it one more time. Collect. Ever so slightly. Constant speed. Now that one didn't work so great, so I'm going to try it one more time. Ever so slightly. And then constant speed. And so we see it's imperfect because there's no string, but it increases up to some peak value, and then it stays constant. And so by using those force measurements, along with the normal force measurement, which we could get from this, if we put it on a triple mean balance, 
we could measure the coefficient of friction. And that's basically it. Your big pieces of lab equipment are the motion sensor. The motion sensor can measure position, velocity, and acceleration for basically anything. It's super cool. It produces graphs with computer software. That's nice. The second piece is a photo gate. It can measure time, but most importantly, it measures velocity. It has these little beams, or a, a little beam that's shot out, and when the beam is cut, it measures the time. And then lastly, the force sensor. Clearly, the force sensor measures force. Uh, it can be used to measure the weight of an object. Notice if I just hang this thing like this, it'll measure the weight. So I can actually just do that now to show you. You see how here it's showing you a constant value? That's its weight. Now, of course, I can do like an elevator problem thing and pull it up, and you can see the force change. Isn't that cool? Force sensors measure force. It's not rocket science. Notice that if you use a force sensor to measure a constant force, and you use a motion sensor at the same time, you could do an experiment to confirm the validity of F equals MA. Basically, all of these devices can be used to confirm or demonstrate every law of physics we talked about. You want to do some energy stuff? You can measure the height of a ramp and then use this to figure out the velocity at the bottom. You want to do any kind of being able to see how this stuff works in class, but I hope this quick little run through of all the equipment at least is going to help you to be a little more comfortable when it comes to answering these things on the OP test. All right, everybody. Have a good one.